In Matthew chapter six, Jesus instructs his disciples and us that we should pray to God in this way. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received the reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What would you do if you discovered you had a treasure in your backyard? You can imagine, you know, the, the, the excitement that it would be in all of us if we found that we had $10 million in our yard. That's exactly what happened back in 2014. A couple in California who wishes to remain anonymous so that people don't know who they are and go ask them for money uh, found a, a tin can on a trail that they had been passing in their backyard every day for years. And uh, the sun hit it just right, and they noticed it had a lid on it, and on their daily hike, just leaned over, popped off the lid of a can, and found a bunch of gold coins from the 1800s. It was actually the first of five of those cans, and uh, the, the coins were so rare and, uh, and so precious that it actually took quite a bit of time to figure out their worth. And... As they looked over coin by coin, they found some that were super valuable. There was one coin that was worth almost a million dollars in itself. And as they went through the process of figuring out how much they had and what this treasure really was, they began to think of what they would do with it and decided that a good portion of it would be something they would give back. This is the basic message of Jesus, that God and the things of God are literally within our grasp. They're, they're right there. They're, they're on the trail that we pass day in and day out. This priceless treasure is available to us. The kingdom of com has come to us in Jesus. The, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, is like a treasure, and it's hidden in a field. But when the man finds it, he hides it again, and in his joy goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. Again, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a, a, a man who is a, a merchant of, of pearls, looking for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he goes and sells everything else he has to buy it. You can call it what you want, eternal life. We call it salvation. We call it God at work. We call it a God thing. We call it how God's ways are not our ways, how God is present and active in the world. But in this this phrase that Jesus uses, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, we capture this priceless treasure that we're all actually looking for. And in the very first words of Jesus, we find the greatest surprise in the message of Jesus and all the message of Jesus and all the, th the things that Jesus says. This, I think, is still the most shocking, that this priceless treasure is available. The time has come, Jesus said, the kingdom of God has come near, is present, is imminent, 
is real. This treasure, God and the things of God, is at work in the world already if we will find it. And when we find it is this priceless thing that we could not have imagined otherwise. In me, Jesus was saying, the realities of heaven, the riches of heaven are breaking forth into the ordinariness of earth. And because of that, nothing will be the same. And in that, in that discovery of God and the things of God, there's both a call for a raised awareness. Jesus calls people to pay attention, to, to be aware, to notice this treasure that we might otherwise miss. And it calls for a response. As in the story that I began with, what are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with this treasure that we've been given? A few years ago, we were um, preaching through the sermon. You know, I, along the way, I, I learned that, um, or have tried to learn that, that rhetorical questions are sometimes dangerous, depending on the setting. When I ask a question, sometimes people respond, and usually not in, not in the Mac so much because you're a little bit further away and we're a little bit in the darker room. But in the sanctuary, especially, and at Greenwood Campus, actually at the Greenwood Campus, there were a couple of adults that I just kind of had to say, like, these are rhetorical questions, right? You don't have to answer uh, if you don't want to. One day I was kind of, I was working into something in the sanctuary sermon, and I, I said, here's the question that we're going to answer. Is God good? And a four-year-old guest, four-year-old not member of our, our, our church who'd never been to Broadway before and I don't think has been since, when I asked the question, is God good, looked up from his little coloring sheet and yelled as loud as he could, yes, and then went back to coloring. <laughs> the kingdom of God calls for that response. It calls us to look up from what we're doing and, uh, and, and, and raises our awareness and then and calls for a response. Jesus, later in the book of Revelation, says, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and, and they with me. So there's this, this combination of somehow God being present in ways that we didn't know were, were possible and God being at work in ways that we sometimes don't believe can happen. This is what Jesus means by the kingdom of God. In Jesus, the presence and the activity of God have come knocking and are ready for us to open the door. Today we begin a year-long focus on that treasure in the invitation that each one of us might be able to open the door and, and discover it in ways that surprise us, probably shock us, and in that discovery, reorient our desires and, and the things that we hold true and valuable and what we think is important and what we think is not important and the things that we, th that they, we think sort of are, are how you get things done and, and maybe how God says things get done, this reordering and, and the discovery of, of the kingdom of God that ultimately disrupts our lives in which we gladly give up everything else so that we can gain this treasure. This message, this treasure, this this. this uh, this description of the kingdom of God is the central message of Jesus. The very first words out of his mouth are an announcement that the kingdom was among us. And this was something that Jesus not only said once, but said over and over again. It's something that if you think about the, the life of Jesus, you could put a lens on how he lived his life. And certainly this is something that he was willing to die for. And, and, when asked how we should pray, Jesus began his prayer with this focus, taught us to pray with this focus. And not in some sort of flashy way, not some, this is not coming through the, the avenue of uh, just <clears throat> one sort of uh, flash in the pan kind of event, but in the daily rhythm of our prayer life to pray this prayer, our Father who art in heaven, May your name be made holy and may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth in the same way that it is in heaven. If that were really possible, if that were really something that we could pray and become aware of in a daily sense, to, to gain a heightened awareness of, of, of the presence of God right there with us and a heightened awareness of the activity of God that we could join in, this would be 
a treasure. If this was heaven breaking forth in earth now, this would be something that is priceless. Whatever this kingdom was, Jesus, Jesus clearly thought that it was something that we, you and I, could find. And that's the hope that we begin this year with. Um, you know, we often do uh, a kind of focus that gives some, some clarity or, or, or focus to our, our preaching and to our year. A few years ago, we'd had our red letter year, and some of you were here then and remember back that far, uh, where our, our, the, the teaching focus for the whole year and our worship focus was on the, the red letters of the Bible, which are often printed uh, red because they're the words of Jesus. And so uh, all of our sermons came out of the, the very exact words of Jesus in, in Scripture. Last year, some of you still don't remember that far back, remember, well, some will remember that we had uh, a focus on the, the story, of, uh, the full story of God from the beginning to the end and how we were called to enter in that story. And we read through the Scripture and told and preached through the Scripture together. This year, our focus is on this thing that was so central to the, the message of Jesus, the kingdom of God. And not just some, so that we can understand it, not just so that we could define it, not just so that we have something to talk about, but in the hope that we would be uh, brought into a process where the kingdom of God is made real in the ways that Jesus talked about. Today, I hope to just begin to spark our imagination of the possibility of, of this, this new reality that Jesus speaks of, to frame the discussion uh, and, and then the process that leads from it today uh, in a year-long process of, of making this more real in your life and in mine. To begin to imagine what it would be like to hear Jesus knocking and to live with a, an increased awareness of God's presence and an increased awareness of God's activity in your life. Now, Sort of the way Jesus uh, talked about this and then taught us, we're, we're going to mimic and model, model the approach uh, that this is going to be a slow, steady process for us to lean into over the course of a year. And there's some, there's some uh, real intentionality about that, that um, there have been plenty of times, and I've been preaching uh, the start of the year for 20, whatever, five years now. Uh, there's there's uh, been plenty of times, uh, especially in my younger days, where I would get really excited about something and we would kind of give a lot of attention to it and then the excitement would wane over time. And that's essentially what every New Year's resolution pretty much is, right? We start something at the beginning of the year and it kind of wanes. Our approach on the, this focus on the kingdom of God is going to be kind of the opposite of that. We're going we're gonna to do the, the crock pot approach rather than the microwave approach. This is going to slowly simmer in us and we're going to pray prayers and we're going to engage in activities that help us begin to access something that is, is there, but that we ultimately and, and often will miss. We're going to do several things together. The teaching focus is going to be on the kingdom of God. We're going to talk about what it is and what it isn't. We're going to talk about how, how it uh, re really begins to reshape our lives as we lean into it and ultimately continue to turn the diamond on the gift, the treasure that Jesus offers us in this kingdom. What it would mean for us to have this at work in our lives, but also what it would mean for the world if we as the people of God really believed what Jesus said. We're also going to pray together. And there'll be prayer challenges throughout the year. Again, this is crockpot, not microwave. We're going to have different ways of praying, any which way imaginable. The point would be just simply that we're going to, we're going to access the kingdom of God the way, the way Jesus talked about it, by praying for it. That ultimately we don't just understand it, but we, God does something in us and through us that can only happen through prayer. So if you don't feel like you're great at prayer, um, you're, you're not alone. Most people don't feel like they're great at prayer. This year is going to give us a chance to lean into uh, the power of prayer. And um, that, that's intentional as well because there are going to be a lot of things to pray for, good things and challenging things that we know of, uh, even within our church. Wonderful things are coming, challenging things are coming, and, and that's just in the, the, the plans that we have or the things that we know are coming up, uh, some dates on the calendar. But we know that would be the same for you personally, the same is true for our community, the same is true for our world. This is gonna be a year we're gonna pray like no other. And if you don't feel like you're good at it, that's okay, that's a great starting point. 
And if you're gifted at prayer or if prayer is a regular part of your practice in your home, then we're just going to ramp that up more. And today we're going to start very simply with that. The other thing that we're going to do, and I think we've mentioned a few times already, is that we're going to share in Holy Communion every Sunday together as a church. And we do this at our 815 service every Sunday, but at 930 and 11, at 9 and 1030 at Greenwood, we're also going to share in Holy Communion. That's a bit of a change. And so I want to speak to that just for a second. This is part of how we're going to lean into uh, the, the, this message. And um, there are a couple questions have come up uh, related to that. The first one is, is the service going to go longer? I mean, I'm, I know you didn't think that, but a few people had thought that. We're adding something. Um, so uh, you may have noticed that we, have re we just took out one song at the beginning of the service, and my goal is to preach shorter. And we're really glad that we took that one song out at the beginning of the service in case I don't preach shorter. But um, the, the, the plan is to not go longer. We have, we have way of, a way of uh, dealing with that. The second question is, how do we do this every week? And they're actually, when you have a lot of people, those questions, those detailed questions become more important than, you know, the, the pastor who has, or the, the worship team who has the bright idea, hey, let's just do communion every week. And somebody's like, well, how are we going to get bread? Or how does that work? And so there is a little bit of a change today as it relates to that. Um, and it reminds me of a story a few years ago. Uh, you know, one of the things that we're known for and is sacred around here, especially with our kids, is goldfish. You know, not the real goldfish, but the little, you know, Nabisco goldfish in the snack area and you can take them anywhere and I stepped on one this morning you know right before church and several years ago our volunteers who were so faithful and so good went to Sam's and they were out of goldfish and in the crisis of belief that followed what we what we did was substitute them for Nabisco Cheez-Its or you know the little Cheez-Its things which you know then then, you're, then it was very confusing because it's like what was your best the best part about church Cheez-Its did you say Jesus no we said Cheez-Its it was very confusing <laughs> but these teenage boys uh, I won't mention their names so these teenage boys there are three of them in one family all teenage teenagers at the same time confronted me one morning at church they ganged up on me it was like they were coming as a wall like Hey guys, what's going on? They're like, Pastor Adam, we need to talk to you. It's very serious. And they're like, we miss the goldfish. <laughs> like, seriously, when are they coming back? <laughs> Explain the situation to you, and we worked through it, basically. I mean, over time, you know, you get, get through these things together. And so one of the misconceptions is, is that only old people don't like change. None of us like change. And some things that uh, we get used to, we kind of get used to. Part of the point of this is that we get out of our comfort zone just a little bit. Uh, and uh, so all that to say, the bread will look a little different today. Nobody freak out. The bread's going to look a little bit different uh, today. Once a month, we're going to have the Hawaiian bread that we love so much. But, um, but a good portion of the month, we're going to have a, a different form of bread, and we will all survive. And it'll, it'll actually be good. So get where we're going here. We're talking about this magnificent thing that cannot ultimately be described, this priceless treasure that is of a, not just one thing, but a million things that capture the, the presence and the work of God in the world. And we're going to access that and lean into it just through a steady, slow process. But, uh, but don't be fooled. What uh, it, we're talking about is more of a crockpot approach than a microwave approach. I think that's actually something really important for our world, a world of breaking stories and new cycles that transition to the next crisis every whatever it is, two weeks, three weeks, six weeks. We're going to slowly, steadily turn up the heat on what it would mean to be the people who believe in the kingdom of God that I think we could, uh, could be. And ultimately, what we're talking about is something that calls for the highest level of commitment imaginable. You may know the story uh, of making breakfast and uh, the, the chicken and the pig were enlisted to help. And the chicken jumped in pretty quickly and joyfully because the chicken had only to make a contribution. The pig took a little more time because, because what was required of the pig was a full commitment. Bacon and eggs. And what's, re what's required of us, what's, what we're talking about here is more, is more pig than chicken. More full commitment than small contribution. But here's what we know. 
and the witness of the people, the, the, the millions and billions of people who have gone before us is that there are many, 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 many saints who have gladly given up everything for the treasure that we will describe. So I want to describe how you might begin to start leaning into that process today of making the kingdom of God more real and more operative in your life and as a result in our world. I want to give you three words to think about what we're doing in the year ahead and what begins right now today. The first word is a, a process that changes uh, what we discover. Uh, you know, ultimately, what we're talking about is a process of discovery that we might discover something that we honestly didn't know existed, like a treasure, like a priceless pearl. The analogy works so well. It's as if Jesus knew what he was talking about, that there's something out there that we might miss unless we are looking for it. And so he says, about the kingdom of God and the great Sermon on the Mount, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and then everything else falls into place. This is something to be looking for. We're going to begin to open our eyes, and I invite you in this moment and, and in the, the week ahead to be looking around, and we do that lots of different ways, through prayer, through our, our increased awareness and slowing down sometimes, or just being present enough in the moment and ask the question, where is where's God? Where is God present? Where is God at work in this? We're going to begin to pray into this reality of increased awareness of God and the things of God. Because the kingdom is something that we discover. It's something that we stumble upon. It's something that is not inside of us. It doesn't come from us. It's not built by us. This is the work of God. And so in our humanness, it is something that inevitably we must discover. And we might walk past it on the trail a million times, only to find it was right there all along. This is something that will shock us and surprise us as we increase our awareness of God and the things of God. Elizabeth Barrett Browning writes in her poem, Earth's crammed with heaven, and every common bush afire with God, but only the one who sees takes off his shoes, and the rest of us just sit around and pluck blackberries. <laughs> now, I think blackberries are pretty holy, by the way. There's, there's something to the power of just being present in ordinary moments. But the point is well taken, isn't it? That uh, this is something for us to be looking for. If, there's, if this is a kingdom that God builds, then our, part of our part is to discover it as if it were a treasure worth finding. And Jesus seemed to believe that God's presence and the activity of God was a treasure worth finding. Can you imagine, just think about uh, working this process. Can you imagine a year from now what it would be like for you to have a raised uh, and increased awareness of God and the things of God? Can you imagine how your life would begin to be different? How your relationships might have a, a sacredness? How you might view yourself and, and your problems and the world and its problems through a different lens, a lens of truth and authenticity, but also of, of hope and possibility? So it is a process of discovery. It's also a process that has to do with what we desire. And so I want you to begin to think, I want us to begin to think about what we want in life, what we really want. And begin with a recognition that is true of all of us that we don't really want God as much as, as we probably even want to. You know, we started that prayer with that prayer last week that um, God, we know that our desire uh, to please you, in fact, pleases you. And we hope that we have that desire in all that we do. This is the process as, as we discover the treasure in the field uh, and then realize the treasure that it is, this begins to reshape what we want in life and, and how, we, how we desire God. The kingdom of heaven is like that treasure that uh, is hidden in the field and then so the guy goes and he sells everything else so that he can have it. And what Jesus says is when he found it, when he hid it again, he went in joy and sold everything else he had. And joy really is the motivator. So many of us have uh, somehow been brought into a religion of obligation, uh, a religion of, you know, sort of uh, somebody kind of pointing a finger at us. This is a process of discovery that reshapes our desires, ultimately because the more we, the more we want God, the more joy we have. 
So many of us have been brought into a religion of saying what we shouldn't desire, and we have somehow gotten in the message that uh, we want too much, that desires are bad. And I think what Jesus says is that we just don't want God enough. And so imagine, again, a process where we begin to ramp up what we want, that we begin to stop taking for granted all the hope and possibility that's right before us and how God becomes more central to our lives. Imagine a process in which our hearts begin to fill up and then overflow with God's grace and begin to pour out with a joy that we just can't contain, a peace that passes understanding. Imagine how that coming out as a fountain source out of your life might begin to affect everything else about you. St. Augustine said, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until we find rest in thee. And so Jesus tells us to seek this first because everything else will flow out of it as we begin to reshape every desire in our hearts. And, and also then the, the next word that comes out of that is this, the, the discovery leads to desire leads to a disruption and, and here's the, the, the beauty of this analogy of the treasure in the field. When someone discovers it and then goes and sells everything else so they can have it, what they do is willingly change everything about their lives so that they could gain this one thing that's better than anything else. It's a complete disruption. And most of us, if we're honest, don't like to change that much. Goldfish crackers aside, we don't like to... to um, to have our lives disrupted. Most of us get into this looking for a sense of comfort and security. And the, the beauty of the analogy of the treasure that is the kingdom of God is that you see people gladly, willingly giving up things, letting go of things, finding the power and the strength to turn loose of stuff that we have up to that point held onto with a death grip out of fear and anxiety. Now, instead, gladly, willingly letting go because they know what they gain is far greater than the way they, what they currently possess. There are, there are a few times in life that we, we do this. It's been said that when we have children, this is the greatest disruption. The first year of a child, you know, of a parent's life with a, a newborn is the greatest disruption of any point else in, in your life. And it is an example of the, the, what we're talking about. It's a kingdom kind of principle that you see parents gladly giving up sleep, glad, gladly giving up sanity, gladly giving up adult conversation and going out and doing all kinds of things so that they could love somebody. And this is, this is what we're talking about, that we begin to gladly give up things. And it does not sound like a sacrifice. It does not feel like an obligation. It feels like a privilege. Imagine, again, begin to dream with me of you being able to let go of stuff that you currently cannot let go of. Imagine with me you beginning to be turned loose from sins that hold you back and keep you captive. Imagine with me and dream with me of you in your own life, in your lived experience, being able to actually love God and love your neighbor and doing things, acting out of that love that you just don't think are, are currently possible. The work of saints and super spiritual people. Imagine with me and dream with me of you living out the, the truth of what Martin Luther wrote in his great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, Let Good and Kindreds Go, Let This Mortal Life Also, The Body They May Kill, God's Truth Abideth Still. Because his kingdom is forever. Imagine with me, begin to dream with me of living with a sense of eternity now. And let's be clear, what we're talking about is something that doesn't just affect you. And this is why this treasure is so important. Because make no mistake, the, uh, the sheer amount of possibility in this room among the people of God is ultimately staggering. If you and I will just lean into this just a bit, can you imagine the change that happens in our families, 
in our community and in our, in our world. The greatest tragedy of all is that this treasure is right there and we will spend much of our time walking right past it or wanting something else more or pushing against the disruption that it would take to, to receive it because we don't want to change. But the good news is Jesus is knocking. The good news is that God continually, persistently invites us into his kingdom. And so with hope and expectation, let's hear that invitation again and let's respond. And the response is simple. It's just one thing that we're all going to do. We're just going to pray this prayer. It's, it's the Lord's Prayer. It's, it's printed on the back of your bulletin. Some of you got it memorized. That's what, you know, it's going to be on the app. It's going to be kind of everywhere. But this is the, the challenge. This is the invitation to just together turn on the crock pot and take that first step and pray this prayer together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. May your name be made holy and may your kingdom come and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if we pray this prayer, make no mistake, things are gonna change and it's gonna be awesome. So as we prepare for communion, let me just read this one last thing. As we dream together, as we imagine what God might do, and as we imagine the, the power of that as, as, we, as we do it as, as a community of faith, uh, this comes from Desmond Tutu's book, God Has a Dream. And he writes, all over this magnificent world, God has called us into his kingdom. It is a kingdom of shalom, of peace, of wholeness, of justice, of goodness, of compassion, of caring and sharing, of laughter, of joy and reconciliation. And as we share God's love with each other, with our brothers and sisters, there is no tyrant that can resist us, no oppression that cannot be ended, no hunger that cannot be fed, no wound that cannot be healed, no hatred that cannot be turned into love, and no dream that cannot be fulfilled. And it is ultimately our prayer that the, the dreams of the people of God might be filled for the sake of God's kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven. May it be so. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.